Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today for building the ideal organic search optimization strategy. We are very excited to have you here. Chet Brock will be leading us. He is the Senior Manager of Online Marketing and is full of wisdom and knowledge. Uh, we encourage you to ask questions throughout. This is a complicated topic. There's a lot going on. Um, we're going to have some sort of obvious pause points where you can ask your questions, um, and then there's going to be time at the end for questions as well. There are two ways you can ask a question. You can either type a question in via the chat feature, or you can raise your hand um, at the end of the presentation. Just as sort of a housekeeping note, the um, Slides of this are going to be emailed out at the end of the presentation within 24 hours, and a recording will be available on our website uh, within about a week. Thanks very much, and Chet, it's all you. Thank you very much, Emily, and uh, I want to thank Emily and, and Wendy Parrish, um, our Director of Corporate Marketing here, for the opportunity to come in and talk to you guys today about uh, the ideal organic search optimization strategy. Uh, you know, here at the Learning House, we uh, we take a lot of pride and uh, put a lot of resources behind the online marketing uh, that we do for a lot of our schools and, and uh, pay, paid search, organic search, uh, and organic search optimization, of course, are, are cornerstones of, of some of those strategies. And uh, I, I really am excited to, to talk to you guys today about uh, what I feel like is a very uh, strong and also very search sound uh, strategy that we're going to talk about here today. I'll try to do my best to uh, leave some break points for everyone so that we can uh, interact a little bit and, and make sure that everybody that's uh, participating today has the opportunity to ask questions. I want to go ahead and get started uh, with a few um, considerations or, or, or things that we'll cover today. Um, the first being that we're going to cover some high-level considerations or high-level assumptions um, that I want to make sure everybody is, is on the same page with. Um, when, it, when it comes to uh, organic search optimization, SEO, as a lot of people obviously call it, uh, we want to make sure that, that, at least for the purposes of this presentation, that everyone is on the same page about certain assumptions that we're going to make. The, uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is the 10 steps. We're going to uh, look more in depth. We'll cover them as a as a whole first, and then we will and then we'll go dive deeper into each one of those steps as well. We also want to talk a little bit about social media's impact on on organic search and the organic search results, and and really what it can mean uh, both to your business as a brand as well as to the, the the rankings and the search traffic that your web assets or your websites get. And finally, uh, at the end, obviously, I'm going to try to leave a little bit of time for just some open-ended questions. Again, we'll have uh, chances for everybody to ask, answer, ask and have some answers to questions during the course of the uh, webinar, but we also will open up at the end uh, as time will allow, and I believe we'll be able to go over a little bit if we need to. So, so let's get started and uh, talk about some things uh, for your consideration. First, um, I want to make sure that everybody understands that, that we're assuming, because this is a, a slightly more advanced uh, level of strategy when it comes to SEO, that your website assets have been relatively optimized for organic search. If you don't feel confident in answering yes to that, to that question, uh, we are going to uh, obviously have uh, some great documentation that the Learning House provides uh, to all of our clients, and uh, one of those is the on-page SEO cheat sheet. Uh, we'll be able to, to email that out to you guys afterwards, and that really is kind of a, a, a baseline starting point for us to make sure that each and every page uh, of your website, in particular the very high, uh, high value or high uh, important real estate on your websites are optimized on page. Uh, so I want to make sure that everybody understands that's an assumption that we are making during this presentation. Consideration number two, branding, as we all understand brand marketing, through mass media is, is very, very important and can influence uh, the search verticals. So what we get into when we talk about what are we going to do with SEO is we start talking about, well, what are we doing offline? What are we doing in the traditional sense of marketing? What are we doing with billboards, radio, kiosk advertisements, word of mouth, uh, television if your budget allows it? These 
mass media channels can influence how much your brand and your products, in this case your degree programs, are being searched online. And that obviously will allow you to be in position to receive a higher volume of search traffic for those, for those particular search terms that mass media are influencing. So I want to make sure that, that everybody understands the value and the importance of branding through mass media and how it can impact uh, our SEO uh, strategies. Next up, we're going to talk about how search engines continue to update their algorithms. This is important for everybody to realize if you haven't heard, uh, you know, Google is updating their algorithm almost daily, honestly. And uh, they do major updates, uh, you know, oftentimes multiple times a year. And, uh, you know, people have probably heard catchphrases like penguin and panda and the latest one, hummingbird. And, and Google has made these, uh, these catchphrase names to, to kind of uh, give almost like hurricane naming to their, uh, to their search uh, algorithm updates. And, and, and sometimes the aftermath of those updates can be like a hurricane aftermath. They, they, really, uh, they really do disrupt what the search results pr uh, provide. And uh, we want to make sure that everybody understands that the algorithms are necessary to provide better results to the user, but they're also, um, they're also uh, quite tumultuous in terms of the strategies that we do. Uh, and it makes them important to, uh, to consider. And finally, you know, the, the alternative to organic search optimization is paid search. That is PPC or paid search ads, pay-per-click. And uh, that particular type of marketing channel has created a, a decrease in valuable organic clicks. Google in particular, uh, Bing and Yahoo have followed suit, has increased the amount of space their advertisements are being shown on search results pages. Therefore, organic search results that are, that are shown typically below the advertisements are receiving less impressions because they're below the fold on the screen. So it's important to realize the impact that, that the prominence of paid search ads have had on organic search and the value of organic search. And, and making sure that you don't forget that there is, an, there is a, a, an important factor to your marketing, and that is that paid search is also uh, kind of a complement to what we do with organic search strategy. Now, I want to uh, real quickly, uh, before we, we dive into the big one, uh, make sure that everybody is starting to maybe get their questions in, if there are any that have been developed up to this point. We haven't gotten very far, so hopefully there's not too many, but it is important to, to go ahead and, and get some questions in while we're talking about the big one that I think, and it's that your goal should not be number one rankings. Everybody talks about rankings and search results. The important thing to realize is that rankings don't necessarily equal leads, student leads, but visitors can so rankings in the search results really don't mean anything unless they, they represent the opportunity to have more organic visits to your website. So ranking well for any given one word does not mean that you're going to convert well for that word either. So just because you think that the word online education is important to you because you work inside of that space and your business operates inside of that space, I can tell you now that that word is not important to your university or to your college. That word is, is really more of an industry-based word. So really understanding uh, not only that rankings don't matter as much as visits matter, but also that the keyword that you're ranking for and that you're getting traffic for uh, is very important and the vernacular there is very important to understand the, the intent. We talk about intent a lot in search engine optimization, making sure that, that intent is correct. Now before we dive into the 10 steps, it doesn't look like there's any uh, questions flowing in yet, so we're going to dive right in and talk real quickly. Uh, we're going to go through the 10 steps of optimization. First being, choose a keyword or a theme. Understand what your theme is going to be, what you're going to focus on. Uh, I equate this to, you know, a lot of times people hear me talk about the whack-a-mole game. You can't go to Chuck E. Cheese and play the whack-a-mole game and hope to get all the gophers. So the same goes for your organic search strategy. You can't have every keyword and be optimized for every keyword at the same time. You, when it comes to campaigning for these keywords and the strategy that we're getting ready to lay out, it really is important to pick a search theme. Oftentimes, and we'll get into this, that will include your brand name or your, your best performing programs. So we'll talk more about that in a minute. The second thing is, is that understanding that there's not just one keyword out there that people are searching for once you have chosen your search theme. 
So generating a keyword list is an important aspect of what we do at the Learning House when we are optimizing a website and optimizing content for that website because it gives us opportunities to have a lot of variance in our keywords, and we're going to get into that as well. The next step, step three, is mapping out your campaign. Uh, you know, this is, this is the equivalent for me of masking off the walls of a room you're getting ready to paint. You have to have a good plan in place. You have to have a good preparation. That will make your entire project go more smoothly. So we really put a lot of emphasis on mapping out the campaign strategy, and we're going to give you guys some tips on how to do that and, and exactly how to lay it out. Of course, you can't have a strategy of SEO without content. Content is king. That's kind of been a word for about 10 years now, or a phrase now for 10 years. So you have to go out write your, and create your content. Now, when we say write and create, that, that's exactly what we mean by that. That could be written word, video, and we'll talk more about that. Obviously, implementation. So we're going to launch. At step five, we're, we're launching the content. We're actually putting it out on the web and making sure that it's available, uh, first and foremost, to your users, to your prospects, so that they can come and read, watch, listen, consume that information. And then, obviously, secondarily, and I do really mean that secondarily. I know it's funny to hear an SEO talk about secondary, the search engines. The search engines are your secondary focus here. Google and, and Yahoo and Bing have focused heavily over the last two years in particular on making sure that webmasters or website owners are focusing on bringing the best, most unique content to the user, and that's what they really want to deliver when somebody does a result. Therefore, it's important that you're thinking about your audience first, that being potentially your current students, your prospective students, in some cases with certain sections of your website, uh, your faculty or your, your administration. Uh, but you want to make sure that the, the, the content is out there and available to everyone to consume. Step six is going to be the linking the content according to the strategy that we built up in step number three. Uh, the the str campaign strategy and mapping it out will consist of links and how you want to link that content together. And the way that you strategically link that content is very important in how the search engines as well as users uh, engage that uh, flow of content and, and understand what it is that you're, you're trying to pitch to them in a way. Number seven, uh, step seven is promoting your content via social media. Uh, social media is a, is a very big factor these days in the algorithms and how much buzz, if you will, uh, is being created around your content. So you want to make sure that you're giving those, uh, those social media platforms the opportunity to get your content out there and be shared. And in some cases where the content is, is really, really intriguing to, to the user base, uh, perhaps going viral, as, as we hear a lot of content, especially things like YouTube videos, go viral all the time. And there is a little bit of a, a method to that. So we want to make sure that, that promoting the content via social media is, is on the list. Step eight is promoting the content via outreach and PR. This is something that we, we uh, are very, very uh, proud of that we do here. It's, it's oftentimes a step that SEO firms and agencies leave off because it is labor intensive and it does take a unique set of skills and, and, uh, and, and a mindset from your, your staff to do it. But it can be done, and, and that is just reaching out, email, phone calls, and, and actually talking to people about the content that you're putting out on the web and, and getting them to come and, and visit and, and look at that content and link to that content, which, again, helps, helps deliver better optimization of the website and the pages on it. Step nine is analyzing the results, having goals in mind, understanding a few of the key metrics that we look at here at the Learning House when we do things uh, uh, that, that optimize certain pages or certain articles that we post, looking at certain metrics and understanding what was the result of that particular campaign or that particular content piece, did it do well, did it do poorly, and then learning from that and moving on. And then my, my favorite is rinse and repeat. Going on uh, to the next step, and that is step number one, choosing the keyword or search theme and starting back from the beginning. This is not a, a do once and forget about uh, type of a, a strategy. This is something that oftentimes, depending on the competition of the keyword that you're, you're going after or the theme that you're going after, can take several campaigns lined up one after another to really start seeing the, the, the fruits of your labor in terms of, uh, you know, the keyword showing up, better rankings, but then also better visits. So rinse and repeat is, is probably one of my favorites, and it's, it's probably one of the most important things we talk about. So, 
no questions yet. There can't be because we haven't gotten into the meat of this. Let's talk about step number one, and that's choosing a keyword or a theme. You know, the, the thing that strikes me when I talk to, to clients is that sometimes they forget that their brand name is one of their most important assets. You have a, a, a decided advantage because typically no one else in your general market has your brand name, and therefore people are already searching for the brand name. They, they are already looking for your school and probably the words online tacked on behind that. So focusing on your brand name is always one of the most important places that we start to make sure that you are securing your rightful ownership of top placement and therefore top traffic flow organically in the search engines for your brand and for your brand combined with the word online or online degrees. Obviously, once you've, you've kind of conquered your brand and made sure that you're showing up for brand and the online keywords that, that, that are with your brand, you can start diving into your, your product base or your service base, and that's your program-specific campaigns. So going down and looking at things like which program that you're offering has high lead to application ratio. This usually is a good indication that, that the program has legs. That, it, that it's got an audience, that people, there's a demand in the market, and that the leads that you are getting in, albeit maybe small numbers of leads, are converting to applications. So that's one place to start looking in terms of your enrollment funnel. The next thing that we look at is, is does the program have a high visitor to lead ratio, which shows interest in the market in that program. So when you have lots of visitors converting into leads coming off the website, even if you haven't started an SEO campaign or started a pay-per-click pay campaign, that's a good indication that that program also has legs and, and can really be a, a solid foundation for where you take your, your, uh, your next uh, SEO uh, strategy. And then, and then finally, we'll look at, at the program. It, it already produces leads, but it doesn't have very much organic search traffic. So people are coming in for your brand name, perhaps, but they're actually converting for a specific program at, at a high clip. And so we start to look at, at which leads, uh, programs are generating leads with minimal organic search, because that may be a place that we can then really go hit hard and increase the number of leads that are coming in exponentially. So just a couple of insights into how we pick a keyword. Any questions about how, how keywords are chosen here and, and, and any other insights you might want to know about that step? Let's move on to, to generating a, a keyword list. Don't hesitate to go back and, and, uh, and answer, or excuse me, ask questions about previous slides if, if something pops into your head. And of course, you can save them for the end as well if you like. Uh, you know, one of the th things I tell my team members when we're getting ready to, to really embark on a, on a a keyword hunt is you need to find lots of opportunities. Find lots of keywords. If you can do that, then you're going to really be able to develop a good list and have a lot of different variances of keywords to choose from to use inside of your content. Also remember that the search engines are looking for natural progression. So that means that they're not looking for that same keyword to show up over and over and over and over again verbatim across the web that points back to your website or the same keyword showing up on your, on your content over and over and over again. So we use tools like uh, Google AdWords Keyword Planner. Uh, we use Keyword Spy, which has both free and, and paid uh, versions. And then we use a great free tool called Ubersuggest. And Ubersuggest is one of those tools out there that, that really um, has, has caught a lot of wind here lately uh, because they maintain their own database and they actually uh, create a database of keywords based off of search intent and not necessarily on search volume. So you get a lot of good ideas that are being searched out on the web, even if they're longer tail uh, and, and don't have uh, as, as much uh, volume inside of a Google tool like the Keyword Planner. We also like to consider those long tail uh, keywords uh, because the lower the competition of the keyword, uh, the better chance you have of, of ranking and therefore getting traffic for it quicker. Now again, we don't necessarily always look at number one rankings, but we do want to show up on page one if we can, and that, that can be accomplished a lot quicker if we're looking at lower competition long tail keywords. These might be t keywords that, that involve both your brand and the program name. They may be keywords that involve the program name, but something specific to your city and or state or some kind of a geographic indicator. 
So look at those longer tail terms. Typically a, a long tail term, although this isn't just a finite science, um, typically long tail terms are terms that have four or more uh, keywords inside of the phrase. And, and so you, you want to look at those types of keywords along with the premium keywords to make sure that you're, you're really attacking um, everything uh, and not just going after the keywords that potentially you'll never get, the premium keywords that you'll never get ranked for and never end up getting traffic for and just wind up being frustrated. And then obviously when we talk about generating the keyword list, and I'm going to show you an example of this in a second, we like to organize our list. Uh, so when we talk about long tail, premium keywords, mid-range keywords, we like to organize these lists into tiers based on the, the search volume. And so when we do that, we can rank them from high to low to understand which words do we think we want to go after, which words do we think will generate an X number of visits if we are able to achieve a particular ranking. And it just gives us a little bit more of a strategic approach about choosing keywords and actually putting them into our, into our uh, campaigns. Any questions about slide two? Uh, we, we're going to look at some samples of the organization here. Um, be sure to get your questions in uh, through uh, the chat uh, if you have any. You know, this is, this is a good view of one of our uh, basic keyword master lists. You know, this is a list broken into three tiers, uh, and, and it obviously starts with some of these very high search volume keywords, 2,400 searches a month for online graduate programs. Uh, and et cetera, and you'll see it breaks all the way down to online bachelors in business at the top of the tier three column, uh, which only is representing an exact match volume of about 16 a month. And when this screenshot was taken, this was performed on, on the national level. So just keep in mind you're talking about that keyword, online bachelors in business, specifically, exactly, is only being searched 16 times in the entire United States when this snapshot was being taken in a 30 day time frame. So you can see how it's important to recognize the potential search volume that the keywords represent. And, and again, this is based on Google's data. There's obviously Bing and Yahoo and other search engines, and they have uh, other search, traf uh, search volume as well. But this just gives you an idea of one platform, Google, and how many searches are being done for given terms. Here's a little bit closer view, just in case we're a little bit closer quarters. So not quite as necessary, but you can kind of see some of the search volumes and how they tear down. So now that we have our keyword list generated, we want to map out our strategy. And when we map out our strategy, it really uh, starts with a good software to use. We, we oftentimes in, in training situations for team members that have not done as much uh, campaign building uh, or campaign mapping, we'll use a tool like XMind or OmniGraffle. Um, XMind is a great free tool that you can, that you can get from, I believe it's xmind.net, uh, and you can actually download this for free, and it has pretty much all the bells and whistles with the exception of a few uh, export utilities. Uh, but, but these tools work well, especially in the early phases of mapping out uh, SEO strategies, because it gives people a visual representation of what it is the map looks like. So we'll, we'll start with a central hub, which in this case was uh, a dummy, you know, this is a, a fake page obviously, but bachelor's in hospitality management page. And we'll take this keyword, primary keyword, online hospitality management degree, and that's the keyword we're going we're gonna to focus on for this hub page. And then we'll, we'll start to branch out from there, and we'll want to understand if we're driving better results for that hub page, we want to start linking between articles. Here's a snapshot of what is hospitality management, just answering the general question for uh, students that might be interested in it. And then talking a little bit more specifically about technology in the hospitality industry. And then linking those articles together because they have uh, obviously a high relevancy, and then taking that quote unquote SEO power, or as we call it, page authority, and passing that into the hub page so that the hub page begins to rank better for the keyword online hospitality management degree. And so you'll see that as we continue to move around, uh, we'll use varying link anchor text. We didn't represent it here just because it's, it's difficult to read sometimes, but we'll use different varying anchor text. This is where your generated keyword list, master list, come into play. You'll want to you take your keywords, link them from page to page, making sure that you're using var close variants of your primary keyword for your hub page to pass those links in. So in this case, there was a, a travel, I believe it was a travel article that we passed 
the, the keyword, the value from the keyword online hospitality management degree our programs into the hub page. And we just, we continue to, to, to look at variants and make sure that, that while the, there are differences in the keywords that we're linking into the hub page, those keywords still have pretty much the same meaning or the same vernacular. Now, I want to talk a little bit more in depth about creating your content because this, this is really a, a, a very key component to this strategy. And, and we've really grown leaps and bounds here at the Learning House in how we uh, create, how we conceptualize content, and how we align that content with both broad and more niche audiences. And so, first and foremost, we want, we want our content to be very timely, we want it to be thoughtful, we want it to be engaging, and, and we want it to be actionable, and that's a, and that's a big one, and, and that's why I italicized it in this slide. Uh, but it, actionable uh, content is, is one that will really demand someone's attention and, and try to drive them into the next step. And so I want to talk a little bit about the, the thought of uh, what is timely, what is thoughtful, what is engaging. What are these components of content, and, and really how do we align the content that we're producing with the audience that we're trying to talk to? Well, for us at The Learning House, we found a lot of success in starting with broad topics. Uh, maybe we'll write an article, for example, about the, the top uh, companies in a particular city that are hiring IT professionals. Now, that doesn't necessarily preclude uh, anything that has to do with academia or with education, but it's probably a highly searched topic that we think we can probably rank for or at least get traffic for in a particular geo-targeted area. So this, this, con this type of content generates broad amount of visibility and broad amounts of traffic that come into the site. From that point, we try to then break down our content into other types of content more suitable for a student demographic or for a student prospect. So maybe talking about why the IT program at a particular school is, is one of the best in the country or stands out from the rest in the area or why so many students are getting placement after the program because of how great it is or how great the professors are, professors are or what have you. So we really try to start talking specifically about that program uh, and, and how it's going to benefit the, the demographic that we're targeting. And then we'll go even further into it. How, do, how can we help you pay for it? Oftentimes we'll go in and we'll start writing articles about some of the uh, maybe 10 uh, IT related scholarships that you may not have known about in a particular area. And, and so that will really help the students start to answer those value proposition questions. What kind of degree do I want? IT. Okay, where do I want to take it? X school. And then how do I pay for it? You know, so what, now that I've made my choice of what I want to study, how do I pay for this? Is it through my business? Is it uh, through, uh, you know, employer reimbursement, uh, tuition reimbursement? Or is it through something like uh, uh, FAFSA or, or financial aid or scholarships and grants? So we really try to help answer those value propositions for the student, but bringing them in through broader topics. And, you know, I, I want to remind everybody here in this next slide that, that content doesn't just come in the form of articles with pretty pictures. Yes, that's a cornerstone of what we do. That's a big part of the type of content we create. But keep in mind that, you know, blog posts are just one of them. What, what about uh, researched articles? You know, nothing, not a fluff piece, but more of a, a really well-researched and documented article that has great citation that dives a little deeper into uh, a particular subject matter in the world of information technology, uh, for my example today. You know, the other thing is video. Video is a great way. You know, it's, it's actually a decided advantage that a lot of the schools have and that we have to work a little bit harder for to get because authentic video needs to really be taken with authentic staff members, faculty members, students. And so we oftentimes have to go to the school and, and get that uh, content produced, uh, whereas many of you in the audience today probably have access to faculty members, to administration, to people in the uh, community around the school that could produce uh, quick but meaningful videos that really speak volumes to the student uh, prospect. So I, I really encourage people to, to think about that. Another thing that we think is a, another item that we think is great for content is, is white papers, uh, often in PDF format. These are great for, for email um, downloads where you just ask somebody for an email to tell them more about 
uh, the, the nursing program at your school or the bachelor's in business administration at your school. So white papers also represent a great format that people will consume and actually even pay for in the form of, of content. If there are no questions up to this point, we're going to move on to step five, and that's implementing your content. You know, we talked early on about remembering the on-page SEO checklist. You know, the, it's talk, it, we're talking about how when you implement this content, whether it's articles, videos, white papers, there are specific things that you need to do to make sure that the page that that is put on in your website is optimized. So always remember your on-page on SEO checklist, and again, we'll be happy to email that out to anybody that, that needs it. Also remember that, that thumbnail and content images, thumbnail images being used on your main blog's front page, uh, and, and obviously the full images, content images, being placed inside of the, the uh, articles or inside of the PDF will increase click-through rates and engagement. If you show me a, wor a wall of words, there is very little chance I'm going to read that article. But if you show me a wall of words that is broken up by nice headings, bold quotes, this is one that people don't think about, you know, using uh, quotes that are very, you know, that are borrowed from the article that have very high impact and putting those into a large, we see companies like Fastco and, and, and even Forbes and other uh, media outlets do this in their, both their printed and their web versions. But when I read those, those bolded words that stick out like a sore thumb, I, I want to go and read the rest of the article because there's something in there that I found intriguing. So remember to use thumbnail and, and, and bold quotes and things like that to increase engagement. And make sure that all the pages are in your site map. If, you, if you're not familiar with what the sitemap is, I'd be happy to answer any email questions about that later. But this is very important because I, so often I will find out that a content piece has been put out by a client and they didn't even have it indexed in their sitemap. And if it's not in the sitemap, then it loses credibilities with, credibility with the search engine because that tells the search engines this is really not an important page on this website, and it may end up resulting in the page not being indexed and not being able to be found on the, on the, on the search results. So it's very important to make sure that, that all pages that are created that you want to be publicly accessible, of course, are, are represented in your, in your site map. So now that we've implemented the content, we want to make sure that we're linking it properly. And some, some companies will, will suggest, well, let's put the content up first and then link to it, uh, or let's link as we move along. And, and so what we try to say is it really doesn't matter how you link it as long as you link it relatively soon after you launch or implement your content. So looking back at the map that you created in step three, it's important to follow that map. That map was well thought out, hopefully. And if that map is going to represent value being passed from page to page to page in your content, then you need to make sure you're following it closely. So don't just put the content up there and then, and then hope for the best. Give it, give it some, some power by passing links between it and give the user, most importantly, something else to look at. Maybe they enjoyed the blog article that you wrote. Well, if they enjoyed that, then chances are they might enjoy the research article or the video that you have on the same, similar topic. Make sure that you're providing links to these other assets because that's going to keep them engaged and obviously, the, when it comes to marketing, the longer you can keep that captive audience, the better chance you have of converting them down the road. Next step that we want to talk about is socializing the content. This is, this is so important for us because when we socialize content, it really uh, starts to get that content out to the rest of the world. Social networks have obviously provided uh, great strides in, in, in finding old friends and family and, and reaching out to communities, uh, members, and, and, and in, in the case of Twitter, you know, being able to actually tweet at some of your favorite Hollywood stars. But one of the best things that social media has brought to us, and social networks like Facebook and, and Google Plus and Twitter, of course, have brought to us, is the ability to promote content. It's the ability to promote ideas and thoughts in the form of articles and videos and even music in, in some cases or audio files in some cases out to the rest of the world. So the better that you make your content, the more likely it is it's going to be shared. And especially when it has that, that human factor, that, that factor that is going to, to make it personal or touch somebody, 
that really is when you know you've, you've created a great piece of content. And the only way that the world, in particular the social world, is going to know about it is if you promote it on the social networks. So put it out on your Facebook page. You wrote an article, your professor wrote an article, put it out on your Facebook and Twitter accounts. Put it on your Google Plus accounts. Plus one it in Google so that it will show up better in the search results. And then the other thing, and this is really one of the, the gaping holes that I see, a lot of clients that I talk to say, yeah, well, we, we always post articles uh, to our Facebook page, to our Twitter page, <clears throat> but that's just the beginning. We also recommend going out and bookmarking it. We use sites like Reddit, which is by far and away one of the best sites because of the different categories that you can place your content into, and really go out there and put this content into communities, uh, micro-communities as I call them sometimes, that will be interested in the topic and share them with other people out on those platforms. So things like, uh, sites like Reddit, Stumble, Tumblr, uh, Dig, BuzzFeed, Delicious is another one. Uh, these are all sites. Uh, Pinterest, I can't believe I'm not mentioning Pinterest. Uh, Pinterest is another one where if you have a great image that you found or that, you, that your photographer on campus took and you want to put it out there, Pinterest just launched actually an article feature where it allows you to post articles uh, that are linked directly into Pinterest and then obviously are, are headlined by great, great images. So, so Pinterest is another one. It's, one of the, it's still one of the faster growing uh, social networks or excuse me, social bookmarking sites out there and, and, and we recommend it, especially when you have media rich stuff to share. So. Uh, take a look at those bookmarking sites as another way of getting your, your content promoted out on the web. So if there's no questions about how we promote our content online, let's talk about promoting content in more of a traditional sense. I, I tell my team members all the time, you can't get a response to your email, big surprise. Pick up the phone. So building a relationship with someone is a great way of getting them to actually, you know, engage your content, not just this time, but next time. You know, we, we talk about, you know, reaching out to bloggers and asking if we can guest blog on their blogs. Can we, and do this in moderation, everybody. But when you reach out to bloggers who have an audience uh, that is interested in a topic you're talking about, maybe it's um, a, a website about accounting and accounting trip tips, you can reach out to that blogger and offer to them content and they, they may just soak it up. They may say, yeah, absolutely, I'd love to. And all you're asking for is that you maybe be able to link from that article back to your site. This is a great way of not just building, building relationships with, with people who can influence these, these topics and influence people to go and, and find the more information on your uh, university or college's website. But these are also people that can actually uh, give you some publicity, uh, give you, give you some, some credibility in terms of talking about a particular topic. You know, the other, the other thing that we talk about is, is reaching out to the biz businesses and organizations in your community that are relevant to the, the topic or to the degree program that you're, you're actually uh, talking about. Go out there and see if there's any press opportunities. Uh, you may hear people in the SEO world talk about curated content. This is one of the tactics that I love. It's, it's going out and, and actually finding, like I said earlier in the, the, the presentation, the top five or the top ten uh, companies hiring IT professionals in a given uh, city, or in your city in this case. Well, that opens up a world of opportunities for us to reach out to the HR group or to the, the business development at that group and, and say, hey, you know, we have written this article and we included you guys in it, and, and we want you all to know that we, we think it's great you're hiring these professionals. We want to educate better professionals in this field. How can we team up and, and, and make it work? Maybe it's just in the form of that link, and that's it, and that's where it stops. But I can tell you that these opportunities turn into real um, fruitful benefits for, for the schools. We did some outreach about scholarships with a particular group, and it actually turned into um, our team here at the Learning House connecting a, a company who offered scholarships in a specific uh, area of study, and they teamed up with our school to, to start offering one student every, uh, I don't remember if it was semester or year, a, a scholarship from their organization. So we're talking about real impact through relationship building. And then finally, you, you, you always can consider, and this is a very ambitious idea here for most of our, our clients, but consider establishing new domains, new websites that are specific to the the vertical or the silo of content that you you are talking about. Uh, this is this is one of those very advanced and aggressive strategies um, that we participate in that will 
will really only come into play and probably really only be necessary if you have kind of reached your wit's end as far as I can't get ranks for this keyword. It's very important to our business model. We really need to go after this vertical, but I can't do it without the help of building other web assets out there. And if anybody has any specific questions about this one, I'd be happy to answer them either by email or by phone because I know that this one can be confusing. A lot of people don't understand the strategy. But, but establishing new domains outside of your school's uh, website it can, can be a very uh, rewarding tactic as well. Finally, step nine is analyzing results. Now, we talk about increasing organic search impressions for uh, keywords and pages that have to do with your campaign. So looking at things like how many impressions organically and how many clicks uh, organically are my campaign-related keywords and pages getting. Now, one of the ways that you can find that is through Webmaster Tools. If you're not using Webmaster Tools, um, I'd be happy to provide everyone with some links to uh, documentation on it, but it's a great tool to better understand where your site is showing up for certain keywords, and in particular, which pages on your site are showing up for those searches. You know, we also look at increasing the amount of organic search traffic. This has kind of been one of my prevailing themes throughout this, this uh, presentation. Don't worry about rankings because rankings don't mean traffic. Organic search traffic can mean leads, though. And so when we talk about increasing organic search traffic, we want to make sure that we're increasing traffic for the right keywords and the right pages that are part of the campaign. And that will really show us that that metric is moving in the right direction. You know, we also like to look at average pages per visit. You know, when we actually have established that we have a flow of traffic that's coming from the search engines to the website, we start to dig deeper and understand, well, what's happening with those visits when they get to the website? Are they staying? Are they bouncing? Are they going to another section of the website? What are they doing when they get there, and are they staying long enough to really, to really engage us? So often we'll look at average pages per visit and the average amount of time that the user is spending on the site from that specific uh, traffic flow. And then, of course, we just talked about a bounce rate for the campaign-related pages. If you're getting people to click on a link on the search result and they're coming to a page on the website, but the minute that they get there, they bounce and they leave and they go to another website or they go back to the search result page, what we call pogo sticking. When they do that, that really can cause not only problems with that page getting ranked in the future, but it also is an indication that the content that was on that page was not the type of content they thought they would find. So even if you got a page ranked very well for online education, which would be difficult, if they came to that page, they probably wouldn't find what they were looking for because it was probably the president of a, of a university or the president of an organization looking for that information, not a student looking for your programs. And finally, we use goal conversions to really track what's happening with the organic search traffic. So a user comes in through an organic search result. That visitor to the website reads our article, reads our content, engages our content, and then hopefully becomes a lead for us. And we're able to track that using goal conversions and analytics to really show a full visitor path from when they came in from the search engine, what they did on the site, and what they did when they, they actually converted. So it gives us a good understanding of that visitor. Any questions about that? that analyzing results is a, is a pretty deep topic. You could spend an entire uh, presentation talking about it. So again, open to questions if anybody has any. Step 10, again, my favorite is rinse and repeat. Now, we often will say that, that the, the reason that you would repeat the same keyword or the same theme over again in a, in a second campaign or even a third or fourth campaign, as we do all the time here at the Learning House with our SEO strategies, um, is because we're going after a high competition keyword. Uh, the keywords require, these keywords require more campaigning because they are in fact being dominated usually by websites that are larger in scope, have had longer uh, indexing in the search results, and, and just are, are more competitive in general. It, also looking at paid search, you know, they're a more competitive keyword in PPC. So really the higher the competition the keywords, the more campaigning you're probably going to have to do. And you really should think about that when you're generating the theme that you're wanting to work on and the keywords that go into that theme. Conversely, uh, you know, the, the lower the competition keywords, 
they may only require one major campaign to get you into the results. Maybe this is a very long-tailed term that has five, six words in it, but you noticed that the keyword or the key phrase converts very well. You may only have to do one major campaign and then actually go into more of what we call a maintenance mode, where you're just adding a little bit of content every month, maybe an article here and there every two months to really maintain the position of that until obviously something like competition is introduced in the market for the same uh, keyword or the same group of keywords. So lower competition keywords obviously are inversely, don't, don't require as much work, but again, may require more than just one campaign depending on their competition. And you know, the other thing that we talk about is, is considering the, the um, expansion of a keyword set uh, for the higher performing campaigns. If you find that a couple of keywords inside of one of the campaigns you finished 90 days ago is really starting to, to get a lot of traffic and therefore a lot of leads in, you may want to consider looking at other alternative keywords that, are, that have the same or similar meaning that you can then go after. So let's say that you went after the word online bachelors in business. That keyword obviously we notice is, is a, it's actually a low search volume, high competition keyword, but let's say that in your local market you were able to get ranked for it and you got some traffic for that keyword and you noticed that that keyword had uh, quite a few leads coming in for it. Well, that's a great job and that's a good sign. And if you're getting starts and enrollments from that, that's an even better sign. So what that tells me is that we should probably expand upon that campaign and go after even larger search volume keywords. For example, going up a tier and going to, uh, let's say, online business degrees or even online business degree in XYZ state. Those keywords are larger search volume, certainly higher competition, but if they generate uh, exponentially more search traffic to your website, they could mean exponentially more leads to your program as well. So that's why you want to look at expanding the keyword sets for the higher performing campaigns because you, know, you, you may have, uh, have really hit a, uh, a sweet spot in the market for your school and for that program. So real quickly, I just want to go through, because it looks like we're about 13 minutes, to, yeah, so about 2.48 or so. I want to talk a little bit more about the impact of social because really what we're talking about here is the, kind of the human nature of sharing content that's powerful. So I like to give five reasons to share. One, social sharing brings legitimacy to your content in your domain. When we look at uh, companies like SEO Moz, which is a, an SEO firm that we work with their software to track page authority and domain authority of, of sites that we manage, one of the big factors in their algorithm or their uh, power indicators is how much is that page or how much is that domain being talked about in social. So this particular reason really relates to SEO in the sense that it brings a legitimacy to the content of the domain that the, that the Googles and Yahoos and Bings of the world really appreciate and, and want to see from, a, from an SEO standpoint and from a ranking standpoint. The next reason is that, uh, that shares within Google Plus can actually influence, despite recent re reports from Google, the results of the promoted content. So if your article or your video is getting a lot of views in YouTube and getting Google Plus shares and plus one in Google, it can actually directly impact how that, that search is being, how that particular piece of content is being uh, searched for and, and being ranked in the search engines. So Google Plus in particular, because of who they are and what that particular uh, 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 search factor can mean, can actually directly influence your search results. You know, the other thing is, is just the potential. We don't necessarily think that every piece we put out is Pulitzer material. But the potential for something to go viral and to really be shared heavily cannot even start without sharing. So you have to be able to go out there and, and promote your content through social sharing in order to even get your, your, you know, we're in Kentucky, so I have to say it, the horse in the race. You have to, you have to be able to, to, to get your horse even in the starting gate, and if you don't share your content socially, that can never happen. So that, that's an important aspect of it as well. Reason number four is that um, recently, and I talked just a minute, moment ago about Moz, about SEO Moz, uh, the search firm, um, they, have, they have attributed 20% of the search uh, algorithm is weighted uh, by social sharing. So what I mean by that is if you ever wanted to know how Google determines what search results to put at the top of the list when you search online business degrees. 
Almost 20% of that most recently is being attributed to how much social sharing is going on around that particular search, uh, around that particular web page. So keep in mind that, that the search engines, and, and Google's not the only one, obviously Bing does as well, although their factor is much lower, it's not 20%. But the major search engine in the world, Google, and, and also remember that YouTube is the second largest search engine in the world, it actually borrows some of these factors how much that particular content is being shared socially on social networks and social bookmarking sites goes into determining where it gets ranked and where it gets placed in the search results. So keep that in mind as well. You know, and the other thing is uh, kind of a, you know, keeping up with the Joneses uh, remark, and this is reason number five, and that is other organizations are doing it, why shouldn't you? You know, if, if organizations like Coca-Cola and Amazon and, and Nike and other large companies see the value in socializing their content, socializing their, their brand and their products, then so should you. And, and, and we really believe that if you're going to be a big player in the market, you really have to hit all of the, all of the factors, and social media is at the, at the top of that list. So uh, those, are, those are five really strong reasons that I, that I think our team does a great job here at the Learning House of, of, uh, of implementing, and, uh, and, and it certainly makes a big impact because it, social sharing, again, represents the jumping off point for our content to be promoted, circulated, and, and shared in, in, the, uh, in the social sphere. So um, that is the, the end of the presentation. I would love to open it up to questions. Uh, we, we've got at least eight minutes left, but I'm, I'm, like I said, we can go over uh, and, and talk a little bit more. Surely I didn't explain it that well. But i tell you what, I'll make sure that, uh, that Emily and Wendy uh, can circulate my email address to anybody that might have any follow-up questions. Um, I'd be happy to, to also take phone calls if necessary. And, uh, and answer any questions that you all might want to take offline. Um, I want to express my gratitude again for the opportunity. Um, if, if you didn't hear it in my voice, I'm obviously very passionate about what we do with so, uh, search engine optimization and, and, so, and the social media impact of that. And, uh, and, and I, I love being able to share that information with, with audiences. I, I've said it before, if any of the, the people on the line have been to the Connect conference that we have every summer here in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, you know, this is the first time in my life, in my career, where I feel like I'm getting to, to educate people after receiving so much great education from others. And, and so, um, from the bottom of my heart, I appreciate everyone, uh, uh, I appreciate everyone attending and, and being a part of it. I do see a, a question from Donald Montgomery. I appreciate it. Um, are you going to send the, uh, the SEO cheat sheet? Uh, the on-page SEO cheat sheet can be emailed directly to you. Um, and... As a bonus, I'll also pass on our online marketing strategy document um, that, that we writ, wrote up. Um, I guess we probably have the last version was written about six months ago, and we've updated it every month since. And that has some great information in there is about pay-per-click uh, advertising as well and about some of the more impactful um, media channels, uh, mass media channels that we use to kind of get the search volumes up in a given market. Thank you, Donald. Any other questions? All right. Well, really appreciate it, and uh, and I hope everyone has a has an awesome afternoon, and uh, and we look forward to talking to everyone more. Uh, and and thank you again to Emily and Wendy. Thank you so much, Chet. I just want to remind everybody that uh, we have a couple of upcoming webinars that might be of interest. Uh, we have two webinars in November that will talk about um, some new primary research studies that we have done with the Association of American State Colleges and Universities and then the Council of Independent Colleges. So they'll be talking about online education sort of straight from the horse's mouth. Um, to find out more about these webinars, I encourage you to go to our website, um, learninghouse.com, and then slash resources. So thank you very much, and uh, we'll be sending the slides out, like I said, within about 24 hours, and the recording will be up on our website within about a week.